Welcome to The Generation Frame, where two people explore their family histories and go on a personal journey to find out more about how their parents, grandparents and great-grandparents lived, loved and worked. That's my great-grandfather. That's your great-grandfather, yes. Mm. With the help of our genealogists and archivists, this is what remains all five foot four of William Burke. We navigate through some of the richest archive collections in Europe. It is an absolutely wonderful place. Family historians love it. We bring to life amazing family stories and the events that shape them. At the end of their quest, we present our two families with a unique addition to their personal archives. Oh my God. We call it the Generation Frame. Meet Laura Cripps, 26 years old, lives in Glasgow and owns a beagle named Arthur. After studying design at college and a stint in the hospitality industry, Laura has started her own business buying and selling antiques. I got involved in antiques through a family friend and ever since I've just kind of never looked back. I think that's what's, what's interesting about this career because it, it can go anywhere and you can find anything. Who knows, I can find a painting in a bin and it'll be worth a million pounds. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Good luck with that one. But Laura wants to know more about her family history because her heritage is all about who she is. The one thing I want to find about my family history is, to be honest, it's, it's, I think it's the slavery link. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, forget about it, it was a long time ago. But, you know, it involves my family. I think, you know, being schooled in Scotland, I know what history we get taught, and it's, it's not that, it's not slavery. So I think it's all about the education. You know, you walk around Glasgow and you see, see the names everywhere. Laura's concern about Scotland's recognition of its past involvement with slavery is a personal one, because living in Glasgow every day, she sees the evidence of it all around her. The slave owners have got massive mansions that are now art galleries, but nothing does it say anywhere or any plaque <laughs> to say where the money came from, you know, how much of an involvement Scotland did have, Glasgow actually had. Laura has some big questions that concern her ancestral past, and in order to trace that far back, she definitely will need some expert intervention but there just might be someone in her family who can help get her started. I think it would be my dad that knows the most. I mean, when we're saying most, probably not that much. <laughs> um, a couple of generations back, but that's about it. But hopefully we can go further. <laughs> Laura's family history quest is a very personal one. Getting in touch with her extensive Caribbean family is going to be vital if she's going to find out more. Now let's meet Neil Fraser, a lab technician from Aberdeen. I am 23 years old, generally outdoorsy person into photography and a scout leader. Like most 20-somethings, <laughs> Neil enjoys socialising with his mates, but his outdoorsiness means if he's not taking scouts on a camping trip, his passion for landscape photography finds him clambering about on Scotland's most picturesque and precarious beauty spots. I can be on the coast, I can be out in the mountains, taking lovely landscapes gets me out and about. So the most incredible landscape would have been when I was, I was down photographing uh, Dunlopsa Castle down in near Stonehaven. And I was down there for a night shoot. And I was there for just around sunset time. And the whole sky lit up. And I've never seen anything like it before or since. I think I've always known Scotland's a beautiful country. But being able to go out and enjoy it as part of a hobby, does make it it's, it's a lot more satisfying as well. Neil certainly feels a connection to Scotland, but when it comes to his ancestry, he wants to look back as far as he can, way beyond his immediate family circle. 
So I've got an ancestor called Frank Craven who served with the Seaforth Highlanders in World War I. We know he died on the 10th of August, 1918. But apart from that, we know very, very little about him. We don't know what battles he was in, what, how he was injured, how he died. And that is one thing I would love to find out more about. Tracing Frank Craven is of particular significance to Neil, as one of his many interests is military history, especially the First World War. It's a really big defining moment in history, and to have an ancestor who played a part in that is really interesting. Hopefully we can help Neil expand his horizons and find out more about his heroic great-uncle Frank. But somewhere in his family tree, there may be someone with such a shameful past that Neil might not be so proud to be related to them. So there is a family rumour that on my mum's side, uh, we have a relation to Buck from Buck and Hare, the serial killers. The rumour's been going about for as long as anybody can remember, uh, and I'm hoping to find out more. This rumour that he's connected to the notorious William Burke could stem from the fact that Neil comes from a long line of Burks. Um, it would go through my, my grandfathers on my mum's side and it would run all the way up. If Neil were to be related to William Burke, there would need to be an Irish connection in Neil's family. William Burke was born in 1792 in Ireland, where after a short-lived marriage, he deserted his wife and family and moved to Scotland. Burke had no known children while well in Scotland, so any of his descendants would have remained in Ireland. Anything that we can dredge up or find would be amazing. Neil sounds like he's easily pleased, but I'm sure we can do better than dredge something up. The first stop in Laura's family history quest is the Kingdom of Fife to meet the family. Laura's dad, Ian, lives in Markinch, and he too shares an interest in the family history. Come on in. Come on in. in fact, dad Ian has already done quite a bit of research, which has extended to a trip to the Caribbean, and he's set down the roots of a family tree. You know, I went to Jamaica uh, two, what, two years ago, yeah. but then it was fantastic. It wasn't a holiday, it was more like a quest, just to find out <laughs> and just basically ask lots of questions. This is what I did, actually, okay. when, I, uh, when I went out there. And it just looks a bit of a mess, doesn't it? I can't understand um. the writing. <laughs> Ian has put a lot of work into his family tree, but it looks like it could do with a bit of deciphering. Luckily, grandparents Panchita and Constantine and Laura's aunt Sandra are on hand to help. This is me. That's on my Ian, when he on was... wedding day. And when we got well, married, our when day. our wedding day, when we got married, that's, that's what, uh, so. What year was that? You are you looks six. about one? No, not one. Are no, you about six, months, old. Yeah. six yeah. months old. Mm -hmm. Ian six months old. Sixty-two. Still sixty-two. Yeah. Yes. 62. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. had dad when you weren't married. That's mm -hmm. great. And yeah. I had to really rush to get to England because if my parents knew about it. So you, I don't think I'd be your it. Par your parents didn't know that you were pregnant? No, no, no. <gasps> because in those days you don't do those things. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So that's, 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 that's your granddad yeah, when, he, when he was young. When you were 20? I was 20. 20, 20 yeah. That's his passport. Yeah. Yeah. That's your passport photo. Mm. Yeah. Goodness gracious. The reason why I came here, I came here to do my nursing and to better off yourself. And we were in the Commonwealth as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the money and the work was a lot better than in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. He came over on the boat, the granddad mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I saw that it took you two weeks. Over. Two weeks, mm -hmm. yeah. That was a long time to... Mm -hmm. It was like a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a holiday, it wasn't it? It was like tourist boat, we came over. Boat, yeah. 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 I went to London, I lived in London for a while, and then obviously mum was in Stoke and Trent. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we men, we follow the women. <laughs> <laughs> London is the place for me. London. In 1948, the Empire Windrush arrived at Tilbury Docks in Essex, full of Jamaican men, women, and children, hopeful for a new life in Britain. In fact, the Windrush and other ships made the trip across the Atlantic Ocean right up until 1971, carrying thousands of hopefuls who were responding to newspaper appeals promising good jobs, housing, and a better life. Unfortunately for most, the reality wasn't quite as advertised. Something new and ugly raises its head in Britain. In Notting Hill Gate, only a mile or two from London's West End, 
racial violence. An angry crowd of youths chases a Negro into a greengrocer's shop. The injured victim, a Jamaican, is taken to safety. But the police have not been able to reach all the trouble spots so promptly. And the quietest street may flare up at any moment. Instead of the warm welcome that was anticipated, these members of the Commonwealth encountered racial abuse, severe prejudice at work and slum housing. Despite the harsh reception, the Windrush generation soldiered on, finding work as manual workers, cleaners, drivers and nurses. We didn't have an expectation, but I thought we would be better received. And I think you find most black people will say the will same, say thing. The same yeah. thing because yeah. in those days it was mm. very yeah. hard. How, how well were you received, you know, when you actually went to some, obviously there's some jobs that you went to? Path interview and the interviewer said to me, like, you're going to start on Monday. And another chap in the corner just said, why did you tell the gentleman straight away that we don't employ black people? Mm. They said that to you. Yeah. That's, that's really hard to hear, I think. Yeah. Well, my generation, if someone was to treat me like that, I think I would, you know, maybe explode, put it yeah. on social media, well, yeah. you know. But it's yeah. better because no. you can speak now and yeah. you, and people will uh, listen, to, listen yeah. to what you're saying. Mm. In our days, we had nobody. Yeah. Nobody was you on know, your side. Yeah. And nobody would listen. Laura's aunt Sandra picks out a snapshot from the album. So, who's this? That's my dad. Oh, that's, that's David, David Leslie. That's David, that's David, David Leslie. Leslie. Yes, David Leslie. Yes. I've never so seen these photos. Right. This distinguished looking gentleman is Laura's great granddad David, who has the distinctly Scottish surname, Leslie. Could it be that this Jamaican family have Scottish roots? Yeah, Ian I'm... mentioned it to me once yeah. and said, believe it or not, Mom, but your name is from uh, Scotland, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. Do you know of any connection then or no. nothing? No, I don't know nothing. This sounds like an opportunity for Laura to do some ancestral detective work and follow her great granddad's Leslie line as far back as possible. We can assume that if Laura's family originally came from Jamaica, then they would have worked as slaves in one of Jamaica's many plantations. Slaves were usually renamed by their owners who gave them popular European Christian names, and they almost always were given the surname of their owner. This means that it may be possible to trace Laura's ancestors through a Scottish plantation owner with the surname Leslie. It's a challenge, Laura, what to do. I've started this. Yeah. I can pass it on to you. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, yeah, you did. You did well. That's Thank you. Impressed, <laughs> Ian. I'm impressed. Very good, very good. I'm impressed. Very good. Yeah. I mean, we don't know. Yeah. Only we all know the little bit that you've told us. But yeah. I, we just need to know just yeah. so much more. It was, you know, a bit upsetting when talking about my like, when my grandparents first arrived in Britain and. <sighs> The way they were treated, that was a bit shocking. I'd never heard them say that before. Um, but it was, they put such a positive light on things. So I think that's, you know, is it, that, that was the most surprising thing that they can keep being positive. Uh, and now, you know, I think they're happy that everything's changed and society is a lot better. But um, yeah, just, I'm just excited to find out more. So for Laura to trace her Jamaican Scottish roots, a good starting point would be the name Leslie. Aberdonian Neil Fraser has travelled to the capital city to investigate his ancestry. Genealogist Lorna Kinnaird has arranged to meet Neil at St Cuthbert's Churchyard in Edinburgh. At night. Hello Neil! Welcome to Edinburgh and St Cuthbert's Parish Church. We're uh, very appropriately placed here because I believe that you've got a family rumour. But first, I want to tell you about the other side of your family, the Craven family. Mm -hmm. And I believe you were really interested in finding out all about Frank. Yes. So I have some information in here about him, about his passing. Lorna has uncovered newspaper cuttings from over 100 years ago that tell the story of Neil's great-great-uncle's tragic end. In August 1918, Frank Craven's parents received a letter from an army chaplain 
explaining that their son had been admitted to a clearing station hospital, suffering from severe wounds. He had been in France for three months, having signed up in July 1917. Just a few days later, his parents would have received a telegram telling them that Frank had died from his wounds. He was just 19 years old. It was in this particularly cruel way that those at home would hear about the fate of their loved ones. First a telegram or letter to hear that they'd been seriously wounded, only to be told a few days later that they had died. During the conflict, no family wanted to receive a telegram, as it probably meant bad news. But Lorna's research has found some new details about Frank Craven for Neil. He is buried in the Souvenir Cemetery in St. Omer in France, uh -huh. um, killed in action. And the, the, the most upsetting piece of information is that he died when he was 19. Wow, what a... It's horrible. He Absolutely. almost got to the end. Yeah. But, so close. Um, Neil's quest was to find out more about his ancestor, Frank Craven. Lorna has discovered that he was just 19 when he was killed in August 1918, just months before the end of the First World War. But Neil also wants Lorna to investigate an altogether different branch of his family tree. So the family rumour is that I'm related to Buck, from Buck and Hare the Serial Killers. OK, so tell me, how long has this rumour been going? It's been going on as long as my grandparents can remember. So we're talking, we're talking 70, 80 years. All the rumour is that we are in some way related to William Buck. Right. That's, okay. that's the only thing that we know. So St Cuthbert's Parish is central to the body snatching that was absolute rife from about 1820s on to about 1832. But in here, um, there was so much body snatching going on that they had to build a watchtower. So the watchtower is just by King Stables Road, mm -hmm. and that was built in 1827. The reason for this heightened security in Edinburgh's graveyards was due to economic forces. In the early 19th century, the capital was the leading European centre of anatomical study, where it was estimated that at least 500 bodies a year were needed for dissection. Scottish law required that corpses used for medical research should only come from those who died in prison, suicide victims or orphans. The shortage of legally available corpses led to a massive increase in body snatching by what were known as resurrection men, who knew they could sell their stolen goods for a good price. Incredibly, in the 1800s, it wasn't a crime to steal bodies as long as nothing material was taken from the grave. And if caught, it was considered a minor misdemeanor at most. This only served to further encourage the practice of body snatching amongst the scoundrels of the day. Contrary to what a lot of people think about William Burke in here, they never actually stole any bodies yeah. from here. They never grave robbed. They just murdered their, their people, you know? So, so they missed the middle bit out then? They did indeed. Neil has learned that although they sold bodies for profit at the same time and place as the body snatchers, Burke and Hare never robbed a grave. Their victims never made it that far. As Neil goes to follow in the footsteps of the unscrupulous William Burke, Lorna will endeavour to bring some honour to Neil's family line by doing some further research into his heroic ancestor, Frank Craven. Laura's questions about her Scottish roots takes her to the ancestral home of the Clan Leslie, the city of Aberdeen, where she meets Sir Jeff Palmer, an expert in Scotland's historic relationship with Jamaica. Hi! <laughs> nice to meet you. Sir Jeff Palmer was the first black professor in Scotland and was knighted in 2014 for services to human rights, science and charity. He wants to show Laura the Powys Gateway, which stands at the entrance to Powys Lodge, opposite King's College in Aberdeen. He thinks he may have found Laura a lead in her quest. Well, we're now inside the, the gate, and if you look up, you will see a family crest. And if you look carefully at the crest, if you look at the bottom right side, yeah. you will see the faces of three people. Yeah. Now, what do those faces look like? They look like black people to me. <laughs> Absolutely correct. And um, your sort of link to this tower is, is very important because you're a Leslie 
And the guy who built this tower is Hugh Fraser Leslie. So that's, that's his crest? That's his crest. <laughs> Hugh Fraser Leslie was a wealthy Scottish landowner and owner of several coffee plantations in Jamaica. Construction of the Powys Gates began in 1833, a date which coincides with the abolition of slavery. Some people believe that the three heads commemorate the family's link with the grant of freedom to the slaves on their plantations. And he spent 25 years mm. in Jamaica. I think he had over a thousand slaves. Mm -hmm. um, he got compensation for them and he took his compensation money and he built this tower. Yeah. And he built it to impress. Not only did plantation owners accrue huge amounts of money through their businesses, but when slavery was eventually abolished in 1833, the British government compensated them for the loss of their slaves, who were considered their property. This amounted to a staggering 20 million pounds, and that's in 1830s money. Buildings funded by this vast wealth were constructed all over Scotland, including country estates, cotton mills, and many other impressive buildings designed to show off wealth and status. I, I just can't believe that would impress people. At the time, it, it would, because it showed you were rich. Mm -hmm. It was an expression of achievement and status as a, a, a very wealthy man. Yeah. Think we've seen enough? Yeah, of yeah, of course. OK, then, let's go. <laughs> So does Laura have a link to the plantation owner, Hugh Fraser Leslie? Does Laura want to be connected to Hugh Fraser Leslie? It's time to meet professional genealogist Elizabeth Cunningham to see if she can clarify Sir Jeff's theory on Laura's connection to the 19th century plantation owner. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Laura. Oh, hi. Nice to meet <laughs> nice you. Nice to meet you. I've been studying your family history and it's so interesting, so I've got lots to show oh, you. Amazing, thank Come you. Sit. Cheers. Records of slaves are almost non-existent, which makes their genealogy difficult. However, records of the large amounts of money paid to slave owners after the abolition of slavery to compensate for the loss of property and earnings do exist, and could have some valuable insight into Laura's ancestors. Elizabeth gets straight down to business. We identified this uh, Hugh Fraser Leslie and uh, when he claimed his compensation in 35 and 36, he had the total of 298 slaves. So you can understand that these slaves were hugely important economically. And it was really, it was, it's really yeah. terribly disturbing. Now, I was, what I was doing was checking any slave, it's called Leslie, attached to a slave owner yeah. called Leslie, and this is what I came up with. Okay. So just to, just to give you the, the way it works. Laura learned from her family that her great granddad with the Scottish name David Leslie came from St Thomas on the east coast of Jamaica. Elizabeth checks if there could be a Hugh Fraser Leslie link. So Hugh Fraser Leslie had an estate in Stones Hope, which is not St Thomas. Okay. So what that does is pretty much rule out uh, Hugh Fraser Leslie okay. as being the slave owner of your ancestors. Right. To experienced genealogist Elizabeth Cunningham, this geographical mismatch is enough to prune Hugh Fraser Leslie from Laura's family tree. She has to look elsewhere on the island for Laura's roots. And she's found a credible lead in the Baldorne estate in St Thomas, Jamaica. I have found some information um, relating to a potential okay. slave owner. Now, I can only say potential because we cannot identify, okay. absolutely. Anyway, I found an Elizabeth Leslie, okay. and she, at the time, owned two slaves. Right. Okay. I don't, I don't know why it's so surprising to hear that it's a woman. I don't know. <laughs> well, there, there were. There, yeah. there were women. But this is more interesting than that. OK. <laughs> so, this Elizabeth Leslie um, was in St Thomas. Right. And she had these two slaves, Jean Agnes Leslie mm -hmm. and Frankie Sally Leslie. Mm -hmm. But what? this notation here mm -hmm. says, by decree of John Stitchell, 
So he has okay. bequeathed these two slaves to Elizabeth Leslie. Okay. So why was she given slaves by? Well, there were a lot of different reasons for it. It could be that um, it, long service. Okay. Um, you know, the, the fact or that just she was. Or more. More she might, like. She might have been pretty. <laughs> potentially. Okay. There is no proof of that. Right. But what is interesting is that Elizabeth was mulatto. So essentially, a mulatto was half black, half white. That was a terminology used at that time. So John so Stitchell. John Stitchell owned Elizabeth. Yes, yeah. in in his will, he um, emancipated her. Okay, that's amazing. So essentially, what we're seeing is um, this Elizabeth Leslie is a potential lead for okay. you. Wow. And it goes back to St. Thomas in Jamaica. This is a revelation for Laura. Elizabeth's genealogical detective work may have found an important ancestor in Jamaica, Elizabeth Leslie, an emancipated slave from Bildorne Estate in St. Thomas. Actually finding out some facts is, is amazing. So thank you for all your, your hard you're, work and You're very research. welcome. It was very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Meeting Elizabeth was more than I thought it was going to be. Uh, I went in with an idea of my family history and walking out with a completely different idea. Uh, so it's a lot of getting used to that my family actually owned slaves uh, as well as being slaves themselves. So that is a, a bit of a biggie. But um, yeah, just a lot of information to take back to the rest of the family. The murders committed by William Burke and William Hare in the early 19th century were some of the most infamous in Scotland's bloody history. When Burke and Hare occupied a squalid slum in Tanner's Close in Edinburgh's Westport, they selected a succession of wayward souls and plied them with copious amounts of low-quality whisky to render them senseless. Many victims were found in the inns and taverns around the grass market. But in Burke and Hare's time, they also could be found in Edinburgh's subterranean world. Neil visits the Blair Street vaults. We're three storeys underground here. We're actually heading underneath a bridge, the South Bridge built between 1785 and 1788. In the 18th century, in a bid to improve access around the city for the well-to-do, town planners in Edinburgh took the radical step of creating new upmarket roads and buildings directly on top of the original old town. Being canny Scots, they intended to profit from the space created below and let out the myriad of caverns and corridors to small businesses. However, to maximise profits, they neglected to waterproof the bridges with unpleasant consequences. If you consider that before Edinburgh had proper sanitation systems, it wasn't just rainwater coming down, it was all sorts of other nasty stuff as well. Uh, so within 10 years of the vaults being opened, the legitimate businesses all moved out. And where the space opened up, the criminals saw an opportunity. Um, and of course, there's a possible connection to the body snatchers because we're quite close here to Surgeon Square, where all the teaching surgeons were based, and we're also quite close to two graveyards. So if you were to dig up a body in the early hours of the morning, and you need somewhere dark and out of the way to hide it before it can be moved to the medical school, then this is the ideal place. It's hidden, it's underground, and the authorities don't come anywhere near it. This is a lawless space in the middle of the city. But if you come through here, uh, we've got an interesting area through here, which we call the tavern room. Of course, they'd be lit just by candlelight and uh, also by uh, cruisy lamps burning fish oil, uh, which would have stank to high heavens. Uh, if you think about the vulnerable people that would have been down here, and they were exactly the type of people that Birkin here preyed on, this is the kind of atmosphere uh, that they would have thrived in. Plenty there for Neil to think about. 
must have absolutely stank in here. Yeah. After they had found and murdered their victims, Burke and Hare swiftly sold the corpses onto surgeon Robert Knox, who publicly dissected them at his increasingly popular anatomy classes. The unscrupulous Knox paid handsomely for fresh cadavers and conveniently asked no awkward questions. Medical science would progress whatever the cost. Laura and Sir Jeff continue their conversation about Laura's connection with Scotland and Jamaica. I'm hoping to, to actually feel proud of where I come from, but more than that is that I don't think, because being mixed race, I have not found a sense of belonging to anywhere, you know, never mind Jamaica or Scotland or anywhere. So that's what I want to kind of find out is where my family's from. Right. If it is Scotland, then that would be an um, amazing turn of events. We've had a long history with Scotland. You cannot write Scotland's history it's without mentioning the Caribbean. So how much involvement did Scotland have in slavery? It's significant. It's significant, um, and the more work we do, the more significant it seems to be. We found out that um, some 30% of the slave plantations were owned by Scots. Um, and when you think of the relative population size of Scotland and England, then the Scots, in terms of slavery, were punching above their weight. It's quite a lot. Uh -huh. So uh, the, it is therefore quite understandable that so many of the descendants mm -hmm. um, from this slavery have got Scottish connections, and it's just not in terms of names, surnames. It's also in terms of genes, yeah. because a lot of the slave owners had children with their slaves. I don't get that mentality that you could treat them like dirt and then to have children by them is just... Do you think yeah. there's people that find a problem with it? That they, they don't want to accept us or they don't want to hear about it? Well, if you look around the country, we don't have a, a museum to slavery. No. We don't have any monuments. It, what we do have is the slave owners, yeah. um, their houses or their estates. Yeah. Um, if we look at, say, Jamaica Street in Glasgow, Jamaica Street was built in 1763. But so, you don't see anything that says that it was. Good, good point. How do we deal with that? And we can deal with that through education. And I think we will produce people which are, which are better understanding mm. and with a better attitude. Yeah. We can't change the past. And um, what I would like you to do is to look positively at the present. The legacy is not just Powis Gate. It is us. Laura processes Sir Jeff's unique take on Scottish Caribbean history. Neil gets closer to the source of his family rumour when he takes a trip to Edinburgh University's Anatomical Museum, part of the old medical school, to meet Janet Philp, author of Burke, Then and Now. Hello, Neil. Hi, Janet. I understand you want to find out a bit more about William Burke. So in the 1800s, the teaching of anatomy in the university wasn't that good. And so several other private anatomy schools sprung up and Robert Knox ran the best one. He had classes of four or 500 students. And for that, he needed fresh bodies. So William Buck was executed. What actually happened at his execution? So on that morning, the 29th of January, 1829, he was led up to the, the space outside St. Giles's where public executions happened. There were 20,000 people there to see him die. They had rented out all of the windows for all the houses around and they executed him. They left him there for 45 minutes, as was the custom to ensure that he was dead. And then the body was taken down. So the main reason I'm actually here is that there's a rumor in my family that I'm related to William Burke. Well, do you want to come and meet what's left of him? Yeah. So, so this is the main guy then. This is what remains, all five foot four of William Burke. Um, 
we display his skeleton because it was part of his sentence that his skeleton be displayed forever so people remember the crimes that he committed. The most common question is about his neck. So although he was hanged, this was before long drop hanging came in. Um, so he only dropped about six inches. So the plan was always to strangle him rather than to actually break his neck. As Neil ponders whether he could detect a family resemblance in Burke's skeleton, in another part of Edinburgh, Sir Jeff and Laura visit Old Calton Cemetery. Right, now what we have here is a, a very famous uh, monument. And what it is, really, it's a monument in the memory of Scottish American soldiers who fought in the American Civil War. Civil War. It depicts American slavery and the ending of it, and the president at the top and the slave at the bottom showing some form of gratitude. Now, what is interesting next to this uh, monument is the mausoleum to David Hume. And, and he was? David Hume was a great philosopher, not just a Scottish philosopher, but a philosopher who has recognized the world over. But what is interesting is David Hume actually stated at the peak of his powers that black people were inferior to white people. And that, in a, in a way, um, gave some justification for the enslavement of black people in the New World. For a great mind like that, it is really a very small mind, mind thing to thing say. To say. Mm -hmm. It's a bit ironic that the statue is next to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> well, that's the thing about life. You know, I don't think it was planned, no. but it is here. Right, let's go. <laughs> Sir Jeff would like Laura to meet one of his heroes, so he takes her to the National Library of Scotland. Well, we've uh, now in the um, exhibition of um, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was born into slavery in Maryland, USA in 1818. In 1838, at barely 20 years old, he risked his life to make his escape from what he referred to as the prison house of bondage. He went on to become one of the most famous civil rights campaigners in US history. I would call him a great man in a sense that he had to educate himself. He, he wasn't educated. Um, and he said in, in one of his speeches that the great fear of the slave owner is the slave who could read. Um, he came to Scotland in 1846 and he gave speeches in Dundee um, and in Edinburgh. How was uh, Frederick Douglass received well, it was dangerous in the sense that he was speaking to people who wanted slavery. Um, they, they saw it as a necessity. Mm. In fact, he found Scotland a lot freer than America. And he, 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 he mentioned it many times. After finding the collected works of Burns in a Massachusetts bookshop, he was so inspired by the poet's words that he made the long journey to Scotland. Douglas wrote in 1846, I am now in Edinburgh, one of the most beautiful cities in Europe. Everything is so different here from what I have been accustomed to in the United States. No insults to encounter, no prejudice to encounter. I am treated as a man, as an equal brother. What do exhibitions like these mean for black people's history in Scotland? I think its value is that it shows the enormity of this history, that it isn't just about please be nice to a black person. <laughs> it is about um, some of these people are relatives. It's that shared... You know, we sh we've belonging. got a shared history. And fortunately now, things are, are changing. Mm -hmm. And um, the representation is there. Representation is improving. Getting there. <laughs> We're getting there. The only way forward is education. We all need to know 
something more about ourselves. You know, um, well, thank you so much for showing me. And I hope now I can turn over the baton to you. <laughs> As Laura takes over the responsibility of the baton from Sir Jeff Palmer, it's time for Neil and genealogist Lorna Kinnear to catch up and exchange notes. So Neil, how did you get on with your investigations into William Burke? I actually got on really good. Got a really good idea for Edinburgh was like at the time. Yep. I then went up to Edinburgh University and they've actually still got the skeleton of William Burke. So I got to stare at it face to face with the serial killer. And yeah, I found out a lot more about what he was like as an actual person. I know that you want to find something else out on your family. So let's go and have a look. Sounds like a plan. So Neil, I've produced a, a family tree for you and you can see all your ancestors here. Um, We've got 122 so far, and yeah. 122? Yep, and there you are there. Neil's original genealogical quest was to find out as much as possible about his great-great-uncle Frank Craven, who he knew had died during the First World War. At their first meeting, Lorna told Neil where he was buried, but now she has some more information. Um, he was in the Seaforth Highlanders, and where he was killed um, is Utterstein, which was a British victory. Um, and they were capturing a ridge southeast of that village. And unfortunately, he was killed in action. Lorna's research tells us that Neil's ancestor Frank was killed in action at the Battle for Utterstein Ridge in France, near the Belgian border, in August 1918. The Scotsman newspaper of the 20th of August reported that the British attack on the German strategic position was a very neat surprise. But, despite it being a British victory, as ever, there was a human cost. But that's not the only ancestor that you've got that was involved in the First World War. Oh, all right. To amateur military historian Neil, this is surprising news. Lorna has uncovered a relation that Neil is not aware of, and he too fought in the Great War. John Craven, mm -hmm. an uncle of right. Frank, was also killed in the First World War. So here we have Francis mm -hmm. here. Francis there. Yep. And we have John up here. So he's the, the generation before. So he was 45 when he died. So it turns out that Neil had two relations killed in the First World War. Frank Craven, who was 19, and his uncle John Craven was 45. So five of variation ages there. Quite considerable. It wasn't just a specific age. 19 mm -hmm. was very young, 45 is very old. Mm -hmm. But they were needed. And it was over multiple generations as well. Absolutely. Which I don't think a lot yep. of people don't realise. No, no. So John Craven was a casualty mm -hmm. and he died on the 23rd of April, 1915. So how did a 45-year-old end up fighting in the First World War? John Craven had been a soldier throughout his life. He had fought in the Boer War at the turn of the century and had survived. Being a veteran, he was called up at the outbreak of war in 1914, aged 44, when he joined the 2nd Battalion of the King's Own Scottish Borderers. While his division held the strategically crucial Hill 60 in Ypres, the Germans attacked using gas in what is now recognised as one of the earliest uses of chemical weapons. After fighting in some of the world's fiercest battles, he was killed on the 23rd of April 1915. He has no known grave. So he's missing in action. But he is commemorated on um, the Menin Gate with another 54,000 troops. I've been to see the men in gate. I've seen the battlefield. So you wouldn't have known that this was one of your ancestors that no, was there? That's not I would have had a look to see if I'd seen yeah. This is extraordinary news to Neil. He would certainly have visited his ancestors' memorial when he visited the men in gate just a few years ago. If only he knew then what he knows now. So he was in the heart of a lot of the big battles. He was, absolutely. In the First World War. And at 45, he was married, he had children. You know, he was going to defend his family and his country. And he died doing it? He did. 
So Lorna has found John Craven, lost in action in 1915, and uncovered more information about his nephew, Frank, who was killed three years later. But what she found out about Neil's famous family rumour? You'd like to find out about William Burke? I would like to see if there is a link. OK. So now Lorna has built his family tree, Neil can easily follow the Burke line from his mother, Louise Ann Burke, to her father, Thomas Burke, to his father, William Burke, not THE William Burke, and to Neil's great-great-great-grandfather, John Burke. So is that where the Burke line dies out then? It's not a case of dying out. That's really where it starts. That's where it starts. Ooh, controversial. <laughs> Can I show you something here? I want to show you a death certificate. Mm -hmm. So this is a death of John Burke. And can you see the parents? Alexander Williamson, mm -hmm. farm servant, and Mary MacDonald. OK. Now, that's different to Burke. That is different to Burke. So this suggests that Alexander Williamson was his stepfather. Okay. And that Mary MacDonald likely called her son John Burke after the father John Burke. OK, so the John Who, Burke. Who, they were not married. So they were not married. Ooh. Okay. That was very controversial for the time. But John Burke was born in Ireland. OK, so we're going back into Ireland now. We are indeed going back into Ireland, as were Alexander Williamson mm -hmm. and Mary MacDonald. Lorna has traced Neil's Burke line back to Ireland, which is where, if any, Burke's descendants would hail from. It's tantalisingly close, geographically, and it's in the right time period. But for a professional genealogist, not close enough. So in your professional opinion about the Burke rumour, mm -hmm. any so is there any truth in it, do you think? I'd like to think there would be. But as a genealogist, we have to deal in facts and we've got to find something that's evidence-based. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's disappointing news for Neil. Or is it? Does he really want to be related to a cold-blooded mass murderer? Still that sort of gruesome intrigue to see if I was connected, though. Yeah. Burke, as ever, remains elusive, but Lorna's efforts haven't been in vain. So you've not just got one ancestor in the First World War, but two mm -hmm. that were involved. And you've also extended the family line on that Burke side that you didn't know anything about. No, nope, nothing at all, so but all the way back way past 1860. Yeah. With a myth like this one, it was always going to be hard to prove, but it's been worthwhile. Through Lorna's genealogical digging, Neil's family tree has grown a lot bushier than it was before. So, family rumour about back in here still lives on. <laughs> We've got no definitive yes or no, and I don't know if we ever will. It's still, there's still to definitely be something, and it, but there might not be, we just don't know. Now it's Laura's turn to find out fact from fiction. It's time to meet Elizabeth Cunningham again. This should be interesting. Laura learned from her first meeting with Elizabeth that her family had a very possible connection to the emancipated slave, Elizabeth Leslie, who lived in St Thomas in Jamaica, in exactly the same area as where her great-great-grandfather, David Leslie, came from. But where did Elizabeth Leslie get her name and her freedom? We were talking about Elizabeth Leslie. Yes last time, so I'm just going to do a, a quick catch-up. So we'd established that Elizabeth Leslie was a slave owner, yeah. okay? And, and, we, and well. we believed her to be a former slave okay. herself. Elizabeth Leslie was a slave in Bildorney Estate, and we know that slaves were generally given the names of their owners. And sometimes, enslaved children took the names of their European fathers. But Bildorney Estate was owned by a Stitchell, not a Leslie. So where did she get her name? Turns out that before John Stitchell owned Beldorney, it was owned by Peter Leslie. Yes, this is complicated, but it does mean that Laura's potential relation, Elizabeth Leslie, could be the daughter of Peter Leslie. And this estate owner, Peter Leslie, has a strong link to Scotland. There's actually a Beldorney castle in Aberdeenshire. Okay which is where the, some of the Leslies 
yep. from. Yep. Fortunately for Laura, facts and figures about the Leslie family are available. Elizabeth pulls out an ancient tome. This book here is the historical record of the family of Leslie. Wow. Uh, between 1067 and 1868-69. That's early. That's, That's very early. Very, very early. What this shows you here is Robert Leslie mm -hmm. of Kinnanvee married Elizabeth Gordon of Baldorney. So they were linked by marriage. Right. What it means is that we could absolutely link Peter Leslie mm -hmm. of Baldorney Estate, where Elizabeth Leslie lived, mm -hmm. directly back to Aberdeenshire. And to a genealogist, this is enough evidence to connect emancipated slave Elizabeth Leslie to Laura's family tree. The, the whole story seems to come back to a castle in Aberdeenshire. It's, so it's, it's amazing that, you know, I never, well, I'm, I'm sure my distant relatives, you know, Elizabeth Leslie, mm. to know one of her ancestors is in Scotland, you know, a few mm. hours away from Aberdeen. Yeah. So I tell you, thank your dad for me because otherwise I would have been going nowhere with this. <laughs> His head will get a bit bigger, but he'll... Uh, that's um... fine. <laughs> so Dad Ian's research and scribbled family tree has provided invaluable information in Laura's quest for her identity. I'm probably going to be labelled as Scottish now, I think, so <laughs> that's, a, that's a big one for me. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Excited to go for a Kaylee. <laughs> It's been an enlightening and enthralling journey around Scotland for Laura and Neil. Laura found out she was descended from slaves as she had thought, but was surprised to learn that her ancestors were also slave owners. I found an Elizabeth Leslie, and she at the time owned two slaves. Neil trawled the seedy underbelly of Edinburgh on the trail of his possible criminal forefather. So this is the main guy then. This is what remains all five foot four of William Burke. And at the same time, uncovered a heroic ancestor who'd all but been forgotten. So he was in the heart of a lot of the big battles. He was, absolutely. In the First World War. And at 45, you know, he was going to defend his family and his country. And he died doing it. Since we've got to know them both, built up their family trees and solved mysteries within their ancestry, the time is now right to reveal one last surprise. We have been crafting a lasting memento for each of them, created from their own family archives with an added dash of artistic flair. It's the Generation Frame, where we bring ancestors and the present generation together for the first time in a unique family portrait. With time to reflect before receiving their surprise gift, how have Laura and Neil found their tour through the family history? So the whole overall process of finding my family history was actually really, really interesting. I'm still very, very intrigued actually, but if there is a link, <laughs> you just never know. I mean, it's just no, getting to see him, getting to know what he was like, what he was like as a person. It's been a really exciting journey. It means a lot because now I know who I am and, you know, where I came from. Now it's time for the first viewing of the generation frame. It's Neil who will see his first. How will he react? Oh, wow. I was not expecting that. <laughs> it's quite something, isn't it? So you've got me, obviously. Um, with my scout uniform. You've got John, with a nice bushy moustache. I'm guessing that's fine, but he's in a Seaforth Highlander uniform. Don't have any photos, so probably doesn't have a representation of him. And then you've got William Buck in the shadows over the old town of Edinburgh. So, sort of hanging over the shoulder, like, it, like most rumours do, I guess. It makes me feel quite connected to my family a little bit, actually. It makes it all sort of... It makes everything sort of tie in. As Neil goes off to find his girlfriend Elaine, Laura is about to cast her eyes on her generation frame for the first time. Oh my God. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> oh wow. 
got um, Elizabeth Leslie, my granddad, my nana, both very young, about 18, 19. Um, my dad in his office uniform uh, and my beautiful mum and then and then me <laughs> obviously wow I absolutely love it um, and it will stay with me um, forever um, and hopefully give it to my children and children's children and never be out of the family because this is my family. Wow. So here we go. Oh, cool. So I'm assuming this is you and your family. I like it, it's quite different to what we've usually got in our house. Yeah, I like your scouty necker. It's just me. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing the amount of work that's actually gone into it. Yeah. It's really cool. It's a lot of detail, isn't it? Yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> Yeah. Neil and Elaine seem impressed with Neil's generation frame. But now it's time for the Crips to cast their eyes on Laura's. What will they think? Ooh. <laughs> oh, the picture. Oh, isn't it? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> How amazing is this? That is amazing. And I'll see me with the, the hat on there. Good gorgeous. gracious. So how good is this? Yeah. That's good. Dad, That's good. you're not stealing this from me. <laughs> this is mine. <laughs> it's so like us, isn't it? Yeah. It is. My mum and dad, you can see them, you yeah. know, when they were younger. Mm. And they would, I tell you, they would be absolutely so <laughs> delighted to see this. And I think I'm going to have to take a picture of Laura to actually send it down to them. So it's gone down a storm with the Crips. And even Arthur approves. Look that way. Yeah. Yeah, you can tell it's you. <laughs> that is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> great. It's uh, yeah, a little uh, eye moisture in it. <laughs> yeah, Moistening it. Moistening it. 